All right, let's open our Bibles to Daniel's book, chapter 7, and we shall learn, starting with verse 15, learn from verse 15 onwards. Now, we have seen the dream in which there were four bees. In the, in the reign of Belshazzar the king, God showed this dream to Daniel, not to the king, I'm sorry, to Daniel. And in this dream, there were four great bees coming out of the sea. And we have looked at them uh, in our previous studies. And so we are going to now move on to the interpretation section, which begins with verse 15. Okay, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, let's get to the text quickly and... Uh, we will first of all uh, read the first three verses, 15 and 17 of Daniel 7. Let me read for you. <clears throat> I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great bees, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. So, Daniel was very disturbed by the dream, according to verse 15. Uh, he says, the visions of my head troubled me. And then we read in the next verse, verse 16, that he called on one of those standing nearby, one of them that stood by. Who was that? Well, I believe that this is an angel. And uh, at a later time, uh, this angel is identified as Gabriel uh, in chapter 8, verse 16, and also chapter 9, 21 you have reference to Gabriel as one who came to help Daniel with the visions. And so in the light of those uh, revelations in chapter 8, verse 16 and 9, 21, uh, I believe this is a reference to the angel, particularly Gabriel, who helped him with the visions. Now, then in verse 17, we are told that the four great bees in, that came out of the sea in the vision represent four kingdoms. Now yes. let's move on to verse 18. And in verse 18 we read, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever. Now what does that mean? The saints of the Most High. Well, the Most High is really a reference to uh, the Lord God Almighty, the Most High God. Uh, this uh, particular phrase has been used uh, in chapter 3 uh, also. So the Most High who is uh, able to control all the powers and authorities of the world is God Himself, is the Most High God. Um, in fact, um, Nebuchadnezzar, in chapter 3, verse 26, referred to uh, uh, the three Jewish boys whom he threw into the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, as servants of the Most High God. So we know that this phrase is a reference to God. And so when it says that the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom, is basically saying that all the... Uh, people who believe in God, particularly the Jews, I believe that in the context it is a reference to uh, the Jews in particular. All right. If you were to look at chapter 7, verse 25, uh, let's go a little forward now. And if you look at verse 25, it says, He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And so there you see another reference to the Most High and the saints of the Most High. Now, this is a reference to the Jews. It will become a little bit more clear when we get there, all right, to verse 25. 
But take note that there will be a war. And according to verse 17, the, uh, sorry, verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. So all, all, the final kingdom that will take control of the power of the world is an eternal kingdom. And it will be in the hands of the saints of God, particularly the Jews who will turn to God at the end. Not the present day Jew who doesn't believe in the Messiah, but the future Jews uh, uh, who will be there when the Lord Jesus returns at His second coming to rule the world. They will be the ones who will see the power of the eternal kingdom of God being established on earth. And this is a reference to the millennial reign of Christ. Now verse 19. Let's go a little further. <clears throat> verse 19. By the way, verse 19 to 28, that is the end of this chapter, you have the details of the fourth kingdom. And uh, so let's uh, take a look at this. Verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Now let's pay attention to the details. Uh, it was the fourth beast that uh, uh, caused uh, Daniel a lot of trouble. He asked the angel, probably Gabriel, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, to interpret the meaning of the beast and its ten horns and other horn that came up among the ten, uh, which was so imposing. Now what is represented by the ten horns and particularly the little horn is of great significance. Um, well, from this point on to the end of the prophecy, Daniel <coughs> uh, was very concerned about the person uh, that is represented by uh, the little horn. He is very concerned. Who is this little horn? And so we, we will see uh, as the explanations come through who this is. <coughs> and um, once again I want to remind you, according to verse 20, the ten horns on the fourth beast uh, uh, were, were actually facing a crisis when the new little horn came up because three of them were removed or rather fell uh, when the little one came and even of that horn and this horn was a very peculiar one it got eyes it got mouth with talk great things and it was looking very stout uh, than all others so this new one is very stout and what's the meaning of stout? stout means strong and tough very stout. Uh, if you say a person is stout looking, that means he is quite uh, inti intimidating look. Uh, he got very strong. USA. <laughs> uh, well, USA. Uh, well I, I'm not going to say who it is. We will see. Let's move on, okay? Verse 21. Uh, I'm going to read verse 21 and 22 together. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints okay now you can see this little horn is going to be uh, hostile to the Jewish believers and not only he was hostile according to verse 21 he prevailed against them now that is uh, quite disturbing to Daniel I believe because Daniel being a leader of the Jews he, he had great concern Yes. Pastor, this saints, is it the Jewish saints or is it including Christian saints? In this particular context, it's about the Jewish saints. Because this is about uh, the nation of Israel. Mm. God is showing Daniel what will happen to the nation of Israel. Mm. <clears throat> so all the kingdoms that are mentioned here mm. are mainly with relationship to Israel. Mm. 
not with res relationship to China or India or mm. United States or Russia. No, it's mm. the main focus here is the it's Jewish right. nation, mm. and so let's keep that in mind. Okay, now verse twenty-two says, "Until the ancient of days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High." So this this uh, overpowering of the Jews continued until the ancient of days. Well, we talk about this phrase or this title last week. Ancient of Days is a reference to God Himself, the one who is from all eternity to eternity. So, the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And so, what we are told there is clearly the Lord Jesus' second coming and where uh, the Lord will overcome and uh, he, will uh, he will judge the little horn and uh, no longer little horn will be ruling over Israel and uh, the Israel will go into a covenant uh, blessing with the Lord who returned so once again I read verse 22 for you until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possess the kingdom see the saints possess the kingdom and so Proper judgment and justice was carried out. Israel was delivered. Judgment was given to Israel means the Lord delivered them. Justice was carried out. And now they have taken over the rule uh, under Christ. Yes? The kingdom, does it refer to the millennial kingdom? Uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. It refers to the rule of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, now in order to understand more of this, let's read verse 23. You, many of these questions will be answered. Mm. Uh, thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. So, uh, then, verse 24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And so we, we are told that the fourth kingdom is a very unique kingdom. It's different from all others. Now that is uh, a bit intriguing, isn't it? Um, you, you remember the, 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 the scene of this vision where a very unusual beast that came out? And this beast had no resemblance to all the rest. Um, <coughs> it was a monstrous looking uh, beast. And um, maybe it's good for you to just <coughs> refer to it uh, in verse 7 of the same chapter. Verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. You look at the words, huh? dreadful, terrible, strong exceedingly, and with great iron teeth, devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from the beast that were before it, and it had ten horns. So the whole picture was one of intimidation, intimidating uh, picture. <coughs> All right, so... That's why in verse 23 we, were, we are told that this is diverse from all kingdoms and she devour the whole earth. So <clears throat> the Antichrist rule, uh, the kingdom of the Antichrist will be a worldwide kingdom. He will have such support from all over the world. Anybody try to oppose him, he will go and crush them, break into pieces. And <clears throat> the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Now this is a question that we often ask, who are these ten nations? Who are these ten kings in the kingdom of the Antichrist? Well, it's not for me to guess. I'm not sure exactly who will be this. But we believe that these kings are to come from the future revived Roman Empire. But one of the things that uh, I'm troubled in these days is that 
to say that it's exactly the revived Roman Empire is quite difficult. Uh, I tell you why. The Roman Empire, in the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, you know, a huge statue, sta uh, head of gold and so on, is a reference to the iron, the lex, right? Which then runs into a mixture of iron and clay. It's not absolutely iron. It's a mixture of iron and clay. Yeah. So when you, when whenever Bible in, uh, interpreters say it's a revived Roman Empire, uh, I I think there is a need to qualify this. It won't be the exact kind of Roman Empire that existed before. And the Bible is also clear: the the clay that will mix with Roman Empire of uh, empire's iron is referred to as the Gentile nations of the earth and so there are a few things probably could happen I'm not sure about it. one the present Europe will be a big mix of the original Roman uh, people and the rest of the nation actually we are seeing it if you were to consider France, for instance. Uh, right now I'm told that the white people in France, which is one of the major countries in Europe, uh, is reducing in number and the migrants from North Africa and other parts of the world are multiplying. Because <coughs> many of the white people do not want to get uh, married and those who get married do not want to have many children, so their population is reducing reducing drastically whereas the migrants who go there to live they are producing like six seven eight children in a family and so they are multiplying so it is said that by 2020 uh, nations like France will have a identity crisis so I think that that proves the fact that this this whole area is going to be a mixed uh, mixed uh, nation of various people. Pastor Koshi, what, what is the Roman Empire? Are they the white people, the Caucasian? Well, generally thought so. Mm -hmm. The Caucasians are... It's not those from Italy? Uh, not exactly Italy, the modern Italy mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, well, I, I, I'm, we don't have the time and also I'm not all that uh, prepared to talk about this. Uh, the Europe that we have today uh, in a way has seen migrations of people uh, because of uh, war, because of uh, their need to find new pasture land or new place of living and job and business and so on. So exactly which kind of race is here Oh it is very God. hard to say. They have got a mixed group now. Uh, generally, the white people, like the Roman Empire. Yeah, so ge generally people would say, okay, the white people, the, the Europeans. Roman yeah, so that's a general feel of things. Um, but I think if, if you take that general view that Roman Empire refers to the white people in general, uh, the people who live in Europe, uh, then I think the mix, mixture of iron and clay refers to a wider mix of not just the Europeans mm. then but but other races as well mm. I don't know wherever in uh, the history of the world Europe ever seen so many Africans and Asians living there mm. yeah. yeah you know everywhere Asians are spreading Africans are spreading and uh, they're having more say now go go and look at uh, the situation in America it's supposed to be a white man's colony, right? They all the white people went there uh, to live, but then people from all over the world has gone, and now the present president is uh, mixed, mm. in a sense, white man and I mean uh, black man and uh, white mother uh, produced this president, and so <clears throat> you see that this mixture is happening. Um, I think it's good to keep in mind, instead of insisting it will be entirely uh, the same old 
revive prominent pine. It's a slightly different in nature. Mm. That's my position mm. on this. <coughs> okay, let's continue now. Uh, verse 25 says, He shall speak great words against the Most High. So he's, he's a blasphemer. He will speak very, very strong words of blasphemy. And he will deny the Lord God Almighty of the Jews, but he claims to be God. Remember, he will, end, according to <coughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says he will, he will enter the temple of God and make himself to be God and demands worship. And so that's intended here. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times and the dividing of time. Now a time is a year, times, two years, so one plus two, three, and a dividing of time will be half. half. So three and a half years. He will be uh, sort of uh, running the show in Israel, uh, exercising his power to control and persecute them for the last three and a half years of um, tribulation, great tribulation. <coughs> so there, there will be altogether about um, 42 months, which is mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 and chapter 13. Now when we come to verse 26, we will see the Lord turning His attention to Israel. And the Lord promises this in verse 26 and 27, But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away His dominion. So who is the judgment that shall sit? The Most High, the Lord Himself. The Lord Himself will come, He will sit, He will remove the dominion of the Antichrist, and to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So the Lord will see to the end of times that Antichrist is removed <coughs> and the Lord will rule. Verse 27, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, that's the Jews, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. So the Lord Jesus will come and He will take control of Jerusalem and the rest of the world and the Jews will be given great power and all the nations of the earth will subdue themselves to Israel particularly because of Christ the King who ruled from the midst and here we come to our last two verses or rather the last verse verse 28 Daniel respond to this whole revelation in this manner hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much trouble me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Well, Daniel was a man of great mental powers. You remember the first chapter of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar tested him and found him ten times better than all the wise children of Babylon. And he was a man of amazing mental power. And uh, when all these things, all these visions and the meanings were given to him, he became so quiet within him he withdrew himself from all other things and thought about these things. And it was such a trouble to him because he understood <coughs> that there are greater times of trouble for Israel. He already went through the great trial of Babylonian captivity. Remember, he is still in Babylon. He has not gone back to Jerusalem. So now the Lord has revealed whatever Israel has gone through for 70 years, is going to be a lot more, uh, uh, what shall I say, a lot more overwhelmed or overpowered by events that are yet to come. Now, just imagine, Daniel is sitting back in Babylon and thinking about all these visions. He's looking through all these visions. You see that after Babylonians, the Medo-Persians will come. After that, the Greeks will come. 
and after that the Romans would come and don't forget this is not the only vision he, he has in his mind. The past visions which he interpreted are also in his mind. So he's putting the, together all these things that God has revealed in his very powerful mind. And he sees everything forward which God has revealed to him. And he realizes Israel's trouble is not over. Israel will deny the Messiah which will result in a terrible dispersion all over the world. Then God will call them back. Then comes the Antichrist which will suppress uh, Israel for uh, three and a half years. A time and times and half a time. And that will be the most horrifying experience Israel will have. And then the saints will be given deliverance by the Ancient of Days who will appear. And so when he thought about all this, one thing he decided, until he dies, he's going to keep all these things in his heart and pray and wait for things to happen. Mm -hmm. Do you know, we must be thankful that we do not know everything about our future. A lot of us like to know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. Will I get a job? Will I lose my job? Will I be sick? Will I be healthy? Will I be rich? Will I be poor? But if you know everything that is ahead of you, can you sleep? We can become very dejected or we can be too presumptuous. We may say, I, no matter what, I'm going to be better because God said to me, or I say, no matter what I do, nothing is going to change, I'm going to get worse. So we, we will have very strange reactions. We will have a lot of strange reactions. And sometimes I think, I mean, for myself, I am very thankful that God doesn't show me everything about tomorrow. And uh, today's, is trouble. today's trouble is enough. enough. <laughs> Now, I think poor Daniel's heart was in turmoil because he, he cared for his people. He loved his people. And uh, if I were to think, knowing Daniel's love for God, the thing that would have troubled him the most is not their trials by the fact that they would reject God for so long. As last night when I was preaching, I told my church, if God, if God would send blindness to my three children, I shall praise Him for that, because now onwards they will never see any more wicked things of this world. Now because they have bright eyes, they see YouTube, they see all kinds of wickedness, and I'm worried what they're watching. Now let me tell you, what is more important, holiness or eyesight? Jesus said, if your right eye offend you, plug it out. Now I don't think Daniel's greatest concern was that Israel will be uh, without a land or anything. Because he knew such things happen mainly because they reject God. And the most high is not the highest one in our heart. What's the point of having the palaces that we live in? So Jesus said, don't cry for me, O daughters of Zion. Cry for yourself and your children. And let's remember this. We learn all these wonderful things prophecies of the future which are coming upon us like a wave like a tsunami crashing on us what is your greatest concern at this moment keep this in your heart and watch yourself this morning a gentleman who <coughs> is hoping in the Lord to start a new church asked me Pastor Koji you have any advice for me well, I said, you look after yourself and your family. 
first. If you want to be a pastor, you look after yourself. Because you get very excited, oh, people are going to join me, I'm going to start, you know, I'm thinking about my church having this, I'm going to preach leather, blah, blah. When you think about all these things, the devil will attack you from the wrong place, which you don't take care of. That's your own sanctity of life. So I told him, you look after yourself and take care of your family that they walk in the Lord. If these things don't get right, you are going to be chopped down like a tree. No use. And I want to say, in the bigger picture of all these things that God has revealed, let's not lose our soul. Thinking about the big things, we lose ourselves. No point. Let's be like Daniel. Bring all it down to our heart and see, Lord, where am I? In the presence of a mighty God, the presence of an infinite God, what am I doing? May God grant us the repentance and the right attitude toward God. Let's pray.